Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome to the conference. Today's topic is from relationship to marriage. Idea versus reality. The idea of marriage versus the reality of marriage. And um, also, even though my focal point is marriage today, I just felt led to talk about it a little bit. Um, this message can also resonate with those that um, may be um, in relationships. You're forming relationships or you're just, you know, I don't know. You've come out of a relationship. I don't know. I, I just think that um, this message today will be able to um, benefit everyone in some way. Or at least, I, you know, let's just hope it will. Okay. Um, so from relationships to marriage, idea versus reality. Well, first and foremost, I want you to know that a marriage is an anointed ceremony. It's an anointed uh, ceremony is holy it is sacred um to anoint means ceremonially confer divine or holy office upon a priest or monarch by smearing or rubbing oil so one thing you must understand about marriage is that when you bring yourselves into union with your mates that is a holy office that you are holding. Marriage is not just about, oh, two people falling in love and they want to make it official. Oh, you know, you know how people, they, to me, they, you know, like, um, oh, that's my wifey and that's my, no, 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 no. Marriage is serious business. You understand what I'm saying? Because that is an institution that is designed and orchestrated by the mind. Of God Almighty. You understand? It's nothing to play with. And when people say. Some people may say. It is nothing to enter into lightly. You know those words are true. Marriage is nothing to enter into lightly. I'm telling you it is serious business. Because it's not about a piece of paper. It is not. I'm telling you. Whoever you join yourselves to. Before, that, before the presence of the Lord. That individual. Will have a very heavy influence on and in your lives for the rest of your lives. Even if you divorce, you know, I, for those of you, they call, they call divorcees. You, I believe will always on this side have some memory of what went on within that union, whether if it affected you negatively or positively, it is something that you, I believe you will take with you all throughout your lives. It is up to you if you choose to see things from a positive light instead of a negative light and take the negative and say, well, you know what? This positive came out of it, you know, and take the positive and apply it and utilize it towards your new relationships. Okay. So just understand that, um, Marriage is anointed. That's a, that's that's a holy thing. You understand what I'm saying? That's a covenant. That is a covenant. God Almighty, you know, He established that. You know, um, marriage is also a ritual. You know, which is a religious ceremony, consisting of a series of actions performed according to a prescribed order. So you must understand that marriage has a prescribed order applied by the Lord. You understand? You don't just get married and make it be what you want it to be. God Almighty is the one that says what marriage is or isn't because God created marriage. God Almighty created marriage. Humanity did not create marriage. God Almighty did. Therefore, he sets the standards. He writes the prescription. He gives the orders. So marriage has a prescribed order. Okay. It is a ceremony. And ceremony basically means it is a, a formal religious or public occasion. Typically uh, one celebrating a particular event or anniversary. Um, it is also defined as ritual observances and procedures performed at grand or formal occasions 
Um, and as far as the prescribed order that I had spoken about, well, first of all, prescribed means state authorita authoritatively, okay? Um, or as by, or as a rule that an action or procedure should be carried out. I want to say that again, state authoritatively or as a rule that an action or procedure should be carried out should be carried out as far as how marriage should be carried out that has been stated by the authority of god almighty who is the highest authority in existence he's the only authority in existence um also prescribed can be defined as a to recommend uh a substance or an action as something beneficial okay now to define order order means the arrangement or disposition of people or things in relation to each other according to a particular sequence pattern or method order is also defined as an authoritative command direction instruction um, it is also defined as uh, to give an authoritative direction or instruction to do something. So as it pertains to marriage, your primary marriage counselor is God Almighty. If God puts you together, then he is the counselor. If God establishes something, then he is the one that says, well, it should be this and it should be that. And you should do this and you should do that because I created this and I and I allowed you to come into this. I put you two together. Well, in some cases, he put people together and, and I put you two together. And this is what I am commanding you to do and how to be and how to act and conduct yourselves within this holy union that is anointed. OK, um. Marriage is divine, okay? And divine means of, from, or like God or a God. Marriage is so serious. It is such a holy thing. It is such a beautiful thing because it stemmed from the imagination of God Almighty, okay? And um, oftentimes, you know, people will fantasize about marriage and they will see it and view it as something like a fairy tale. Now, you know, I'm not saying anything negative about it because to be honest, I really believe that uh, that was father's intent, you know, was for marriage to be this beautiful prince charming fairy tale, you know, thing with, you know, like a prince with his princess. And of course, because marriage, you must understand that when marriage was created, it was created in perfection. OK, because um, before the fall of Adam and uh, the transgression of Eve, um, they were married. You know, they were married. And um, to my understanding, they were married when I, I believe that when father brought Eve to Adam, there was a I believe there was a ceremony. You know, you don't have to go by what I say, but I know Adam and Eve were married. I know that much. I know they had a covenant, but they had the perfect marriage. Now, ladies, isn't that something to have a man that don't cheat? Don't even look at another woman like that. And fellas, isn't it good? Wouldn't it be good for you to have a wife that doesn't even look at another man like that? So marriage was created in perfection, but it was brought into imperfection due to Adam's transgression in the garden when he disobeyed God. OK, he did something to disobey God and that brought sin into the world. Sin tainted marriage and made it what it is you see in the world today. A hot mess for a lot of them and you know so but it was to me it was just something that uh, I, I think that people still have that fantasy you know p nobody gets married saying okay now this is some toxic mess and I'm ready to get into it you know I <laughs> I believe that people you know, some people, they really feel like, you know, this is my Prince Charming. Or for you fellas, you feel like that's your princess for life. And uh, so you imagine, you fantasize, oh, it's this and it's that. That's why a lot of you have uh, prince and princesses themed uh, marriages. You know, your brides look like princesses and the grooms looks like, he looks like uh, the Prince Charming. And, you know, it's like, 
um, you have your family and friends around to observe the union and everything's just decorated so beautifully, you know. But then the nightmare comes afterwards for a lot of people. So that's why I say, you know, there's a lot of fantasy surrounding marriage. And I believe it just stems from, a, I don't know, I, I, you know, I, I don't know, just what people anticipate. But that's not what it is, you know. And I do understand that uh, it is what you make it. But I think that for those that feel it's going to be um, flowers and candy and all that, it's just not going to be that. It's not going to be that. Because there's an adversary out there called Satan, the devil. And he doesn't want your union to um, be blessed. And he doesn't want your union to be, um, you know, fortified. He wants to interfere. You know, so, you know, Satan is the third party. You know, a lot of you may not see it that way, but he's the third party. So when you start having trouble in your marriages and stuff... You better believe there's a force behind the scene, an invisible force behind the scene that you cannot see. He's in operation because you must understand that the enemy always desires to come up against the things of God. Satan knows that God created marriage. So anything that father creates, Satan, you know, he will attack. Name me one thing that God created that Satan didn't attack. If you want to look at it uh, in a deeper way, Satan even attacked himself. Okay. I mean, God created Lucifer, right? But Lucifer was his own worst enemy. Okay. He condemned himself to hell. And not only that, but you know, he had, he has forever separated himself from the presence of God. And we all know that the presence of God brings peace and prosperity and love and care and comfort. You understand? And, and understanding, you know, the peace of God passes all understanding and Lucifer was without understanding, though he had wisdom. Because see, when you have knowledge that you don't apply, then you abide in ignorance. So Lucifer was ignorant. He was a foolish thing to rebel against the almighty God. Because I'm telling you, rebelling against God only leads to your own self-destruction. And Lucifer, he had to learn that the hard way, you know. And um, But you know, it is what it is. So, but, you know, that's why it's very important, you know, even in your marriages to just, uh, you know, force yourselves to do it father's way. Because if you don't, you must know that there's a force out there that wants to break up your happy homes. Or if you're in an unhappy home, he don't care if you're happy or, or unhappy. Satan wants to break it up. He's just like, he just, he's attacking the union. He's not attacking necessarily how you feel. He is, but his main goal is to separate something that um, Father God put together you know or if he didn't put it together some people put themselves together but you know i'm not even gonna go with that direction right now but anyway i want to talk about um also uh things that the enemy will introduce to your marital unions and not only you know marriages but also relationships in general and that would be infidelity you know um he knows that the um, greatest weapon against marriage is infidelity um, a lot of people just can't move past it. They can't get over it. Betrayal is something because betrayal is something that is so low and dirty and thought out and planned out. And I think it's also just the, the thought of it that the person even contemplated, you know, betraying their um, mate. Um, a lot of people, they just uh, they can't move past it. And that's understandable. That is so because to me, that is like the ultimate line to cross. I, I I I have no respect for people that cheat. I have no respect for that. I'm not saying they should not be forgiven, but to me, there's no excuse. And I know I know a lot of people have a whole list of excuses. Well, you know, your wife was holding out, or your husband was holding out, or you guys got angry about something. Maybe he didn't take out the trash, wash the dishes, and you're just sick of him because he does it repeatedly and you just feel like he's really trying to sabotage it, sabotage the union deliberately or just whatever the situation. But one thing I want you to know is that there is never a legitimate reason to justify cheating. A lot of people may say they're not getting what they needed at home, so they cut out on their partner. Well, Regardless of that, it was still a decision that was made. Even though you were in, uh, in neglect in the union, 
Well, you know, you did take a vow for better or worse. And you were just dealing in the season of worse. And see, that's the reason why a lot of marriages don't work out. It's because everybody is all for the better. But they don't want to deal with the worst. And who does? You understand? But if you don't want to deal with the worst, don't take the vow. That's why I said, you know, marriage is more serious than what people realize. You better know what you're getting into. You know, what if one day your wife just says, you know what? I don't want to sleep with you anymore. I'm sick of you. This, that, and the third. In the eyes of the Lord, you know, I mean, you can't go out and cheat because of it. But there's also a scripture in the Bible that says defraud, don't defraud one another. Now, Father also says that, you know, so for you ladies out there that's holding out on your husbands, you know, God is not, I, I don't feel he's pleased with that. I, I believe I've read in the Bible, defraud not one another. Because that's kind of pushing your partner to commit adultery or to cheat, you know. And uh, it doesn't excuse what they do. But the enemy, it can uh, create a, a opening for the enemy to come in and entice them. And we all know that uh, Satan is a seducer and he's a tempter. You understand? God doesn't tempt anyone. The tempter is Satan. Satan is all about temptation. Remember when father went up into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights? He was fasting and the tempter came and was tempting him and telling him, showing him, taking him up on a high pinnacle and showing him all the kingdoms and stuff and talking about what he would give to him. How in the world can you give to me what I already got? You know, I mean, that's how I'm looking at it. How is Satan going to give Jesus Christ anything when Jesus owns everything, including all of us? You know, but that's how the enemy is. He always wants to present something to you that he knows is not his, but he'll tell you he can give it to you. It's the same way in marriage. You know, he always wants to present something to you that is not yours and try to make it seem better than what you already have when it is not. You know, so when, you know, the enemy tries to introduce people to people and they, they're already with somebody or whatever, they're already involved or whatever. He's presenting somebody to them that's, that's not even, you know, it, they don't even belong to the devil. You know, but he'll try to dangle them in front of uh, the uh, person that he's tempting as if I can give you this and I can give you that. When you know that person doesn't even belong to Satan. So Satan is always someone trying to give somebody something that, that doesn't belong to him. And it doesn't belong to the person he's trying to give it to in some cases. Because for one thing, that's not your wife. You understand what I'm saying? That's not your wife. That's not your, your woman that Satan is trying to give to you. You already have. What the enemy is trying to present to you. That's what I'm trying to say. Maybe I'm not conveying it the way I want to. But anyway, um, he's trying to give you something that you already have in front of you. If you are willing to do the work and make it work. That's what I'm trying to say. And, and also, you know, the enemy, you know, he always wants to paint the grass as being greener. Well, you know what? That's part of the temptation. That is part of the temptation um, to make illusion, you know. Make something seem like something that it really is not. That stems back to imagination. That's fantasy. You know, imagining things. Um, especially things that are impossible or improbable. You know, meaning probably not. Okay? Um, see, the imagination deals with fantasy. Um, but maybe not the actuality of the situation. So that's why you know the Bible says... Um, and all that I get and get understanding. You know, you must understand that, you know, we live in a world where, to me, it's just illusion. I'm not saying these things aren't tangible and we can't touch them and that they are not real. But I think sometimes there's a certain fantasy that comes behind a, a, a lot of the things that we perceive and see. You know, that's not so. Even with marriage. That's why a lot of people perceive that marriage was one thing and they found out it's another. Marriage is work. It's labor. It's hard. It's an office. You're holding an office. You are holding an office before the Lord. You are in an office with somebody else. And so you have to take your positions and make it do what it do. And a lot of people just don't want to put in the work and they don't want to do it. And that's why their mess crumbles and fail. And then before you know it, they've messed up somebody else's life. So now this person's got to file for divorce. That means file for a legal separation before, you know, the, the eyes of the Lord. And now they've got to go somewhere and get some marriage counseling to heal. I mean, divorce counseling to heal. You know, because their emotions have just been torn apart by somebody that was a fraud. 
But anyway, that's why it just pays. Don't play with people's lives. You know, I would say to people, you know, if you're not ready to get married, don't get married. Don't allow anybody to ever pressure you into marriage, whether it be your mate, your family, your mothers, your fathers. Never allow somebody to pressure you to marry somebody that you are not 100% sure that you want to spend the rest of your life with. Because that is what marriage is. It is a lifetime commitment. That's what it is. But I understand things happen and that's not what it always will turn out to be, you know, because, of course, if your spouse cheats on you, nobody wants to stay with a cheater. They've broken the covenant. They've broken the vows. They have tainted the marriage. They brought poison into the situation, you know, and um, who wants to stay with somebody like that? I'm not trying to put no ideas in nobody's head, but I'm telling you, you know, some people just they don't see they don't know what marriage is. They get involved in the union. And they don't have counseling, you know, before the union. A lot of people just meet each other. They fall in love. Well, now let's get married. And they don't even know what it is. They don't even know that Christ is involved in that thing, in that situation. They don't even know that God Almighty is the one that thought up marriage. How in the world are you going to get married? And you and your spouse, you, well, you and your potential spouse, don't go before the Lord and talk to him. I'm talking about all three of y'all. Sitting there talking about what father's expectations are and what your expectations of father are as well and what your expectations of one another are. And once you put it all on the table like that, then nobody is caught off guard. And by that, I mean, as, as it pertains to like infidelity issues or anything like that. Ladies, let me tell you something. I Lay down the law before you get married. Fellas, let me tell you something. Lay down the law. Before you get married or before you get into any type of a situation, even in your courtships, even in your dating or whatever, lay down the law. You let that person know right up front what you will and won't tolerate. And I, I'm not saying do it in a manner that you feel like you're being bossy. I'm just telling you all, you need to let that person know what your standards are and that if they don't feel they can meet your standards, there's no need to form a union because it's going to fail before it begins. You know what I mean? If you're the type of person that, you know, you don't tolerate infidelity and most people don't. I mean, let's just be real. They may not say it, but they don't. You you need to let that person know you cheat on me. You're out. I'm telling you now. I'm not saying that everybody has to say that because a lot of people, you know, they've been cheated on and they forgave the person and they stayed with the person. They chose to stay with the person and you have every right to stay with someone, you know. But then for those of you that say, no, mm -mm, I can't I can't live with this. I can't live with the fact of knowing that this person broke our vows, you know, especially after all the time and the effort you put into shopping for your dresses and, you know, getting your hair done and, you know, buying your shoes and buying the decorations for the um, chapel and, you know, you, and just talking with your girlfriends and stuff like that. If you have any of your bridesmaids, you know, and just all just the excitement that you were in. And then just to have that person Make a fool out of you. Public humiliation. Because, see, that's the thing about it. When, and this goes for fellas or, the, or my sisters. When your mates cheat on you, you know, that's humiliating. That's humiliating because that person has just publicly disrespected you. You know, and not only disrespected you, but that person has disrespected you all in the presence of those that never wanted you two to get together in the first place. In the presence of those that said, oh, that their marriage ain't going to last. They ain't going to work out. You know, that mess ain't going to work. You know how people are. You all know how haters are. And what that person did, they just fed right into the mouths of both of your haters. Because, see, you must understand something. My brothers, when a whore comes up against your wife, she's not just coming up against your wife. She's coming up against you, too. You understand what I'm saying? When you lay with whores, when you lay with whores, you are defiling your own union. You know why? Because the two are one. So father and looking at it as, well, just that's just two people down there. You are one. You understand? You are one before the eyes of the Lord. So when you disrespect your wives, you're disrespecting yourselves. And not only that, I believe you're bringing a curse on yourselves. Because what man ever hated his own body? Come on in here. And a lot of you fail to realize that you and your spouse, you are one. That is you. 
when you look into their eyes, you may as well be looking in the mirror of reflection. You understand? I'm telling you what God Almighty says it is in so many words. The two are one. And so when you allow Jezebel from hell to dangle her um, ankles and heels and wrists and boobs and booty and crouch and all of that into your faces with Satan sitting down and dwelling in her real quiet like enjoying his movie. He, now, I would say he got his popcorn, but no, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> like it's a movie, though, just, just symbolically. You know how you go to the movie theater and you sit down and you eat your popcorn and watch the show? Satan just in there watching the show. He know he got this harlot dangling around in front of your husband, ladies, or got this harlot dangling around in front of your wives, fellas. And the only thing Satan sit, sitting back doing, he wants them to take the bait. Take the bait. Dangle, dangle, dangle. Take the bait. And when people are weak in their flesh, and a lot of people are, they'll take the bait. And what did they just do? They just destroyed something that is so special and beautiful and was supposed to last a lifetime for three, four, or five minutes of pleasure. And, you know, to me, that is just... Well, the Bible says don't call nobody a fool. But you know what? I can't think of no other words, so I'll just keep my mouth shut. That is stupid to risk everything that you have for a five-minute whore. And I'm talking to you fellas or you ladies out there, you know, who may be in involvements and your spouses or your significant others have cut out on you. And you were the valuable thing. You were the gifts. You were the, the all. You were the everything, and they risk losing you and a lifetime with you, for a five minute whore. What kind of stupid mess is that? That's the reason why. Now I'm talking about me personally. I don't have no sympathy for people that cheat. I feel like that they reap what they sow. They get exactly what they deserve, and I feel like whether if. Um, their spouses or their significant others remain in the union or not. They still get what they deserve because just because you are there doesn't mean you are there. And what, I, what do I mean by that? I'm talking about the you that was getting dressed for your wedding day. I'm talking about the you that was making plans for your wedding day. I'm talking about the you that looked at them and you just melted. That's the you that I believe they don't get back. That's what I'm talking about. So they got you, but they don't have you. You know, the original you that you were before they did what they did. And you know what? That's something they have to live with. To know that in the back of their minds, they know, you know, that they betrayed the best thing that ever happened to them in a lot of cases. That's something they have to live with. You know what that is? That's called their own personal torment and their own personal hell. And I believe that's the hand of God. Because Father said, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. I will repay. I probably quoted that wrong. But anyway, I think it's vengeance is mine, said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, said the Lord. I think that's how it goes. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Basically what I'm saying, Father is the one that's going to get them. Okay? Because I'm telling you, when the judgment of God is on somebody, they don't have no peace. You know? And, and it is the peace of God that passes all understanding. So they don't have no understanding. So they're in conflict. You know, and confusion is not of God. The author of confusion is the devil. The devil is the one that wants you unstable in all your ways. You know, the Bible says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You know, he, he can't make a logical decision. He can't make an intelligent decision. It's the same with, with women. Women that are unstable in the way that they think. They can't make an intelligent decision. So, you know, when a man comes along and he um, shows them a little attention and gives them a little bit of uh, flattery, she'll spread her legs for him, knowing she's got a good man at home that takes care of her, pays all the bills, even though she, she can work or not work. It doesn't matter. You know, and it's sad because a lot of times it's the good men that end up with the bad women and it's the good women they end up with the bad men. And then you have very those rare cases where the good end up with the good. 
Isn't that something? Because one thing you must understand, when you are a good person, there's something out there in the realm of the spirit that we call Satan the devil that's waiting to send one of his own to you. You will always be a target as long as you are on planet Earth. If you are a good person, if you're a decent person, you are a person of good character, you are very faithful. See, Satan hates loyalty. You know why he hates loyalty? Because God is loyal and because he was not loyal to God. He was not loyal to Father. He, he cursed Father. You know, Lucifer, a lot of people don't look at it like this, but I believe he broke Father's heart. Father loved Lucifer. That's, you know, you don't hear people talk about stuff like that. But you imagine if somebody you loved cursed you out and tried to take over your home, tried to take over your kingdom, what I originally wanted to say. Somebody you loved gave beauty to above all the other, um, you know, angels or cherubs. Or wisdom, full of wisdom, beautiful. That's what you fail to realize. Lucifer was absolutely beautiful. He was gorgeous. And God gave him that gift. And God gave him a position, a rank, authority. He was a, a, had a high rank. But pride. Pride destroyed him. Isn't there a scripture that says pride comes before the fall? He thought too highly of himself. So you can't ever forget where you come from and who you come from. Because when you get too high, trust me, to every high, there's a low. So the higher you go, the lower you can, you're going to fall. The, the heavier the impact. You understand what I'm saying? That's why you have to be humble with any gift that God gives you. You have to be humble with the gift and towards the gift. And for you men out there, you need to be humble towards your wives. You need to be affectionate. You need to be caring and considerate. Of how they are and how God created them. God did not create them like you. Women are very emotional. And women, uh, they crave affection and attention. And some women more than others, especially for those of you out there, you fellas that are married to women and their fathers were not present in their lives. That I, I believe those types of women will be more clingy, more needy because they didn't have that male role in their lives growing up. So, I, and I think that stems to why a lot of women chase after men. You know, when you see women chasing after men because there's a male energy that they didn't get when they were little girls or young ladies. You understand? So if you want to know why your wives are like that, that might be one of the reasons, you know, as to why they um, are so clingy and call all the time and texting all the time. And, you know, you might love her, but I said, I shouldn't have said it like that. You love her, but I hope, but you, you, you just tired of your phone ringing and you know, when you're tired of all the hit me back, this and hit me back. She's clingy. She's clingy because she's made you her whole world because you can provide to her something she may not have had growing up as a little girl. You know, I'm just saying, I'm just putting it out there. I don't know. So you just have to have patience with your, with your ladies. Okay. Have patience with her and understand she's a woman and that's how God created her. So she's going to fill a void there when you're not there because you're, you know, you're supposed to be. Okay. And, and the same thing for you, um, ladies, you know, if you have a man and he's clingy, you know, maybe he didn't have that female influence growing up. So that's why he's always blowing up your phone and keeping tabs on you. Where you at? Where you going? When you coming home? Da, 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 da. Always want to know. And then we also know a lot of times folks doing that because see, they out there doing something they ain't not supposed to be doing. Okay. They want to know where you at and make sure you ain't where they at. Okay. Let's just keep it real. But anyway, I'm just saying, that's just me talking. Just saying, putting out there what I feel. Um, you don't have to accept it. You can or cannot, but I know what I'm talking about. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, I want to talk about also infidelity and just how it, um, it taints relationships. A lot of women in their marriages and even their relationships, you tolerate infidelity because you, you, we all, as women know, we can't control men. You know, men are going to do what they want to do, just like we're going to do what we want to do. But one thing that your man must understand, there's a consequence to their action and that they will not only have to answer to you, they have to answer to God Almighty. Because you know why? The divine union. God don't play about marriage. He don't play about marriage. 
God is faithful. That's what people fail to realize. We serve a God that is faithful. He does not deal with infidelity. He does not. You're either for him or against him. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ said, um, he was talking about, uh, you're either hot or cold with him. He said, if you're lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. So you're either for Christ or against Christ. You're either holy or unholy. You're either saint or sinner. You're either saved or not saved. You're either loyal or you're disloyal. You know. With God, there is no middle ground. You can't straddle the fence with God Almighty. You got to, you, you either keep it 100 or you just don't keep it at all. Keep it 100 or you don't keep it at all. And a lot of people, you know, they have that frame of mind. Keep it 100 or don't keep it at all. If you can't be loyal, then walk away. Stay away. Get away. And, you know, that's set in stone for a lot of people. And a lot of people, they, they, they're they just uh, no-nonsense people. They just don't play that infidelity mess. Because they know they are loyal. And they know. Those are the ones that know there's no excuse for it. No matter what problems may um, be presented in, in the uh, divine union, they know that there's no excuse for it. There is no excuse for betraying a person. None under the sun. There may be, um, how could I put it? There may be temptations and things, you know, but ultimately we are in control of ourselves. We are in control of where our feet walk, where we drive our vehicles to, whose houses we go to. These people, they're in control of whether or not they want to drive in that hotel lot and get it on with somebody that is not their spouse, not their man, not their woman. There are steps in between. Getting up in the morning, getting dressed, and ending up in somebody's bed that they should not be in. That in-between time is the time that they have to decide, do I want to hurt this person right here? That I am one with. That I am in a covenant with. That will have my back. When this person that I am seeking temporary pleasure with. Will not. Do you really want to disrespect that person. And make them look like a public fool. In the eyes of their enemies. Who said your marriages wouldn't work. Do you really want to do that? Because see the same humiliation that you're putting on your spouses. Male or female. Or on your significant others. Male or female. You're going to reap that back. You're going to reap it back. You can't, you, we don't live in a world where, you know, you, people can get away with things like that because, you know, yes, God is a creator, but people fail to realize that God almighty is a judge. You understand what I'm saying? He is the judge. He is the judge of judges. Okay. And, uh, he's going to make sure that righteousness prevails. And it is what it is. So, you know, when judgment falls on people, you know, and uh, a lot of people, you know, they just have to deal with it. They have to live with it. So instead of living the rest of their lives with somebody who um, would have loved them unconditionally, now they have to live the rest of their lives with people who don't love them at all. You know, because there's a difference between love and lust. And there is no way I would ever choose lust over love. There is no way in the world. You, you know you know why? Because for one thing, love is so rare in this world. It is such a rare emotion. Do, that's just something that's in the heart of somebody else. You know, it's just, it's rare. It is so rare. And there's so many people, you know, they've married people that um, they were in lust with. It wasn't love. And that's why they're divorced um, three, three or four weeks later. You know, um, it was not love. It was lust. They found the person attractive. They had some type of emotion, but it wasn't the real thing. You understand? It wasn't the real thing, you know, because I believe when it's the real thing, uh, you'll know or you'll find out. And by that, I mean, uh, you'll find out because um, people can show you better than they can tell you what they think of you. And people can show you better than they can tell you if they love you or not. Love. Is an action word, my brothers and my sisters. It's not a, it's not lip service. You can tell somebody I love you, but how they treat you 
will confirm what they've spoken. You know, it will um it will let you know what they're about. And I don't mean them going out buying you material things. A devil can buy you material things. And you'll see it as an act of love. But, you know, remember the scripture when Jesus said, and ye being evil, know how to give good things to your children. And so what he was talking about, uh, you know, like if you being evil, know how to give something good to your child. Then what is to say of God being good and holy, you know, giving good things to people that are not good. I, I know I didn't probably word it exactly how father said it, but you know, you know what I'm talking about for those of you who know the scripture, familiar with the scripture. You know, Jesus was basically saying, you know, you give good things to your children, but you know, anyway, you're evil, you know, so meaning, you know, just because somebody can do something nice, I, I mean, an evil person can do something nice. You understand? I know I'm kind of rambling on this. I can't put it into words exactly. I got so much I want to say. But anyway, um, Infidelity, for one thing, it scars relationships because now um, it introduces a brainwashing. And to brainwash means uh, to make someone adopt radically different beliefs by using systematic and often forcible pressure. So basically brainwashing um, pressures a person to start thinking a certain way that they originally did not think or were not their original beliefs about the situation. OK, so meaning um, it, it's basically they used to think one way, but now they've been forced to think another way based off of the action of another or the actions of another. So meaning, oh, well, because somebody cheated on them, you know, in the marriage or the relationship. Now, everybody on earth is a cheater and everybody on earth is an honest and a backstabber and two faced and, you know, but just because. That very well may be the majority. That doesn't mean that it's everybody. Okay. There, there's a minority to every majority. Okay. So just, so just because that may be the majority doesn't mean that's the minority. That's what I'm trying to say. You've always got your little pool of people out there that um, are different. You know. Your true blues. But they're so rare. It's, it's kind of like a, I don't know. When you find, it's, it's just so rare. It's like, Father just kind of threw them into the midst of whatever is contrary to them. It's like, if you discover somebody like that, how in the world did you find them? Like a needle in a haystack. You take a haystack, for those of you that have seen a haystack or you work with haystacks. You know, maybe you do outdoor work or whatever with animals. If you find a needle in the haystack, you'll be like, what in the world is needle doing in here? Among all this straw. That's what it's like when you find somebody that is loyal and that is faithful. It's a needle in a haystack. And most likely, it will only happen to you once in this lifetime. I'm not saying it will, but maybe once. Because for, for one thing, that footstep was ordered by the Lord to you. Okay? And so, you know, as a result, anyway, getting back to the brainwashing thing, as a result, you know, of the infidelity, a lot of people out there, you've become brainwashed. You've become brainwashed, so now you have a certain way of thinking. And that's understandable. That's, that's understandable, you know. Because to me, infidelity is a very dirty thing. I, I just don't, you know, I know people may feel like, oh, well, you're a little harsh. You know, people make mistakes. Everybody's human. Yes, that's true. But, you know. You have to understand that um, if you want to do something to hurt yourself, that's one thing. But when it involves another person, to me, that's just a, I don't know. That, to me, that's crossing the line. It's kind of like, I don't know if I should use this as an, as an example, but for people who, you know, if they want to go to hell, go. But don't drag nobody else with you. It's kind of that situation. I, I remember people, I think they used to say back in the day, if you don't want to go, don't hinder me. That's what they used to say. If you don't want to go, don't hinder me. So it's that type of situation. If you want to abuse yourselves and abuse your own bodies, you know, with mankind, do it. But don't drag somebody else into your, um, into your situation, into what you want to do. When what you do affects the lives of other people, you don't have a right to do that. First of all, you don't have a right to do it anyway, even to yourselves. But you definitely don't have a right to do it when it pertains to hurting somebody else. You just don't have that right, especially those that are in marriage unions and so forth. Because marriage, 
from what I've been told, it's, it's a way different ball game, and I know it is, than relationships, even the feelings that are involved. You know, and I've, I've, you know, I've talked to uh, women that, are, that were married, and they were like, oh, no, it's just totally different than boyfriend-girlfriend stuff, you know. And so um, you just don't have a right, okay, to, um, you just don't have a right to do that to somebody else's life. If you want to destroy your own lives, fine, do it. But don't do it to somebody else. Because you could have easily not bothered that person if you knew that you were not about anything. You knew you were not about that life. But you promised them that life. And they gave you their life. And became your wife. And all you brought to them was strife. And to that back, you put a knife. And now you wonder why you alone and you crying. At night. Can I talk about this thing in here today? It's not right. It is not right. Infidelity is not right. Cheating is not right. It is disgusting to be unloyal. That is a disgusting thing. That is somebody who has a dirty character and no morals. And I know there are people out there that don't like it. You're serial cheaters. But you got a dirty heart. You got a dirty heart. You have a heart that's mischievous. It's dirty. And what you, people like that need to do, you need to go to the Lord. And you need to tell him, create in me a new heart. A heart that is like God's. Faithful. The way it's supposed to be. And just because somebody cheats now, that doesn't mean they can't change, ladies and gentlemen. They can change. And when they do change... I would have the ultimate respect for someone like that. Because, you know, nobody's perfect. And we have all been disloyal to God. We have all cheated on God with Satan. Let's just keep it real. So, if Father can forgive us, we can forgive others. But, you know, I wanted to talk about the brainwashing, though. And people thinking, you know, everybody is like the one that hurt them. So, let's talk about brainwashing achievements it is when their mind is controlled or altered by force changing what they believe think value and do and uh, the behavior patterns that can develop um, as a result of that um, means um, the behavior patterns mean the way they conduct themselves afterwards. You know, their way of thinking in regards to other people. Or, well, just because this person cheated, that person is the same way. And most likely they're not. They're two different people. Two different classes of people. Two different upbringings. You can't judge people by the content of somebody else's character. But that is what brainwashing as a result of infidelity can establish within you all. It's a toxin. Infidelity is toxic. It, it's a poison. It's toxic. And it can totally destroy people's lives. Um, so now as an, a result of the brainwashing, now they have a new idea. You know, which is a thought or a suggestion as to a possible course of action. So now everybody in their mind is going to have that course of action. Well, that person's going to cheat. That person's going to cheat. That person's going to cheat. And you can't say that. You're not God Almighty. You know, for a lot of you out there uh, that have run into those types of toxic people that can't keep it real, Father may have place someone in your past that could keep it real to heal you all and to change your way of thinking to um, basically aid you and assist you where you have been brainwashed into thinking where well, everybody is like that woman everybody's like that man everybody and everybody is not okay So we're talking about the idea versus the reality. Everybody's not that way. Reality is the world or state of things as they actually exist. As opposed to an idealistic or notional idea of them. And notional, that simply means, notional simply means existing only in theory or suggestion, an idea. Okay? That's what that means. That's just what you're thinking. So, um... When you allow uh, subjugating forces to interfere in your uh, unions, whether married or relationships, but I'm mostly 
the topic was marriage idea or versus reality uh, when you allow uh, subjugating forces to interfere meaning um, I'm just gonna say it like it is interfering hoes okay male or female you know you will um, you're introducing toxins into your unions now subjugating basically means uh, to bring under dominion or control especially by conquest defeating you know it is um an influence that contributes to a certain outcome okay so when someone wants to bring uh your partner into subjection you know they're trying to um, bring that person under their control and the enemy working behind the scenes would be the devil so you know ladies you know and gentlemen you know they'll try to dress up somebody and make somebody to be more appealing than their spouse or their significant other and it's all an illusion so satan is all about decorating and painting and things of that nature he's never about the real he's never about the things that are authentic you know the things that are, are of god but when you're dealing with subjugating forces their um intent is to bring someone under their dominion under their control because if they can control that person then they know that they will have more power and authority over the person than the person that they are in a divine union with, a legal union with, a legal marriage. Okay, are you understanding? You know what I'm saying? And uh, forces basically means make someone do something against their will. Uh, it also means to tempt, to compel. Now, that term make, um, I, I, you know, hmm. I'm going to take that out. I'm not going to use that. I will just say tempt someone to do something against their will. Because you know what? Uh, sisters, let's just keep it real. Uh, these women out here are not making these men do anything sexually that they don't want to do. And fellas, let's just keep it real. These women out here. Uh, I'm sorry. These men out here are not making these women do anything sexually that they don't want to do. Okay? So we'll just say tempt someone to do something against their will um and even as far as it being against their will i'm going to take that out as well because sometimes people are tempted to do things that are their will okay i believe when people cheat um that's their will they want to now some people may say they cheated and they really didn't want to as it pertains to they didn't want to hurt their spouse well if you didn't want to hurt your spouse you would not have hurt your spouse you chose to climb into the bed with a harlot. You chose. Everything you did was a choice. Why? Lust, flesh, desire, temptation, and the enemy working behind the scenes. Okay? And so when you deal, you know, when people, people just don't care. They only care about that, that five minutes or however or whatever. They only care about that five minutes, but it's going to cost them a lifetime. Is it worth it? It's really not. But, you know, people just do what they, what they do. Hey, they have to suffer the consequences. Uh, the person that they disrespected does not. Um, there's a scripture in the Bible in Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse 25. It reads, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Jesus is telling you to love your wives. Father's telling you to love your wives. Love your wives. I know a lot of people may say, you know what? I don't love her. You know what? <laughs> I'm just telling you what the Lord said. I'm going to leave that alone. Okay. Um, in Revelation 21, 9 through 10, the Bible states that the bride is the lamb's wife. Um, Revelation talks about the marriage of the lamb um, and the bride of Christ, you know, um, you got to understand, marriage is a, it's just, it's sacred. You know, our union with Jesus Christ is sacred when we all uh, get married. Right now we're the bride of Christ. When we get to heaven, we'll be his wife. And I know the world don't understand that term. But see, that, that the world don't understand the things of God for they are foolishness to him. Yeah. The world will find all this biblical talk and all this spiritual talk to them is foolish because they don't have the intelligence of God. Because they don't know God. You have to know God in order to be able to uh, accept, maintain, and contain his intelligence. 
It don't mean you know everything he knows. It just means he takes what he takes the his his knowledge and he gives you a little bit. And those that are outside of his knowledge and outside of his will will not understand it because the things of God are foolishness to the world. Okay? That's why the world don't understand what marriage is. That's why the world don't understand what faithfulness is and loyalty and fidelity. You understand? That's why the world don't understand that when you're having problems in your marriage, yes, I would advise you to go to a marriage counselor, of course. Father has given uh, people down here certain abilities and skills and talents to assist each other. That's, that's why we're here, to help one another. But you better take it to God first and foremost. You better take it to the one that created the ceremony. You better take it to the one that created the ritual. The divine union called marriage. And with that said, I'm going to close this thing out. Because I don't want to give any more than I feel I've been given. Because if I do, it'll be me. <clears throat> and my opinion doesn't matter. I mean, it does matter, but it doesn't matter as it pertains to other people's lives. Because you can't live your life <clears throat> based off the opinions and interpretations of other people. You can agree with what they say and apply it to your life. But what I'm saying is, you live by every word that proceed out of the mouth of God. For man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceed out of the mouth of God. And with that said, God bless you all. Until next time. Bye-bye.